Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The topic of our webinar is Hot Topics in Continuous Disclosure, What SME Issuers Need to Know. My name is Jeff Scanlon. I'm a lawyer in the Corporate Finance Branch of the OSC and I'm the coordinator for the SME Institute this season. I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for today's session. Mandy Tam is an accountant in our Corporate Finance Branch. Alex Fisher is a senior accountant in our Office of the Chief Accountant. Craig Waldy is a senior geologist in our corporate finance branch. Katrina Jenke is a senior legal counsel in our corporate finance branch. Jason Koskala is manager in our office of mergers and acquisitions. Marie-France Barrette is a senior accountant in our corporate finance branch. And Shafali Joshi Clark is a senior forensic accountant in our office of the whistleblower. We'll send evaluation forms at the end of the session and we'd appreciate your feedback on the session. We'll also be sending CPD certificates via email after the session. Before we begin, I'd like to remind participants that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the presenting staff and do not necessarily represent the views of the Commission or other Commission staff. The presentation is provided for general information purposes only and does not constitute legal or accounting advice. Information has been summarized and paraphrased for presentation purposes and the examples have been provided for illustration purposes only. Responsibility for making sufficient and appropriate disclosure and complying with applicable securities laws remains with the company. Information in this presentation reflects securities laws and other relevant standards that are in effect as of the date of this presentation. The contents of this presentation should not be modified without the express written permission of the presenters. The objective of the OSC SME Institute is to support small and medium-sized businesses in facilitating cost-effective compliance through issuer outreach and education. It is important for issuers to know securities regulatory requirements and to help them navigate regulatory waters. The idea is that if we can help issuers to better understand the disclosure requirements, they can focus their resources on building their company. Ultimately, we both have the same goal, for issuers to provide appropriate and meaningful information to investors and stay on side regulatory requirements. It's important to remember that at the end of the day, investor confidence in the information that companies provide is critical to the success of the company. Today, we'll be walking you through some key topics, including a review of the Continuous Disclosure Review Program, the CD Review Program Results, and CSA Staff Notice 51-355, uh, corporate Finance Branch res Report in OSC Staff Notice 51729. We'll be reviewing some MDNA issues, non-GAAP measures, mining disclosure issues. We'll also be providing a cannabis update, a review of M&A issues, uh, specifically relating to related party transactions, as well as whistleblowing issues, and, and finally reducing regulatory burden initiatives uh, affecting continuous disclosure matters. We'll end the presentation with questions, and at the end of the presentation is the contact information for all of today's presenters. At this point, I'd like to pass it over to Mandy so that she can provide an overview of the Continuous Disclosure Review Program. So our Continuous Review Program is critical to investor protection as it monitors issuer compliance with the Continuous Disclosure Rule requirements. The Continuous Disclosure documents are important as they provide information to investors for making investment decisions. We help companies understand and comply with their continuous disclosure obligations through our compliance programs and issuer outreach and education initiatives. We mainly complete two types of reviews. There are full reviews, which are broader in scope and generally involve a detailed review of an issuer's continuous disclosure record for at least the past 12 months. We also conduct issuer-oriented reviews that focus on specific accounting, legal, or regulatory issues that we believe warrant scrutiny. We generally select issuers for review using a risk-based approach. In addition, we may select an issuer for review if, one, a filing appears to be substantially non-compliant with the requirement of the Securities Act of Regulations, two, a filing appears to contain information that is misleading, false, deceptive, or misrepresentation, three, we're seeking to assess compliance with a new regulatory or accounting requirement, or four, the issuer is impacted by an emerging risk or market trend. We typically correspond with issuers primarily through comment letters. The potential outcomes of our reviews include prospective disclosure enhancements and filings where the issuer is informed that certain changes or enhancements are required in a SNCC filing as a result of deficiencies identified. 
There's also issuer outreach and education where the issuer receives a proactive letter for alerting it to certain disclosure enhancements that should be considered in its next filing or when staff of local jurisdictions publish staff notices and reports on a variety of continuous disclosure subject matters reflecting best practices and expectations. In some cases, there would be refilings and other regulatory actions for significant deficiencies. Specifically, an issuer may be added to the OSC's three-year refilings and errors list, which is accessible on our website. Now, this could happen if staff identify a deficiency in a continuous disclosure document, which requires refiling. This could also happen when an issuer must file a previously unfiled document. You can refer to our staff notice on this matter, which is OSC Staff Notice 51711. In other cases, if the issuer has substantive CD deficiencies, we may also refer the issuer to our enforcement branch and or consider a cease trade order and or note the issuer in default on the OSC's reporting issuer list, which is also accessible on our website. Now, this could happen in many different circumstances. One example is when an issuer is in default of a specific requirement, such as when it hasn't filed a continuous disclosure document by a due date. For some reviews, the outcome could be no action, meaning that the issuer does not need to make any changes or additional filings. So as you may already know, this, the CSA established a harmonized program for continuous disclosure reviews in 2004. The goal of the program is to improve the completeness, quality, and timeliness of continuous disclosure by reporting issuers in Canada to ensure that Canadian investors receive high quality disclosure from issuers. For further details on the Continuous Disclosure Review Program, we refer you to CSA Staff Notice 51312. The notice talks about the objectives of the program, how we select issuers for review, which I mentioned is generally a risk-based approach, description of the types of reviews we conducted, the review process, and how we resolve issues. Now, what I want to focus on now is the CSA Staff Notice 51355, which summarizes the results of our CD review program activities for the years ended March 31st, 2018 and March 31st, 2017. The notice was issued jointly across the CSA. The results of the CD review program is published in a staff notice on a biannual basis. It outlines broad results of 840 CD reviews in fiscal 2018 and 1,014 CD reviews in fiscal 2017, of which 19% and 20% were full reviews and 81% and 80% were issue-oriented reviews, respectively. Now, this chart depicts the outcomes of those reviews across the country, and these results include both the full and the issue-oriented reviews. Now, we've classified the outcomes of all reviews into five categories that we previously discussed when giving the overview of the CD program. Some reviews generated more than one category of outcome. For example, an issuer may have been required to refile certain documents and also make certain changes on a prospective basis. Now, the largest review outcome where action was required was in the prospective changes category. So in 25% and 24% of cases in fiscal 2018 and 2017 respectively, our review resulted in a commitment from an issuer to amend disclosure on a go-forward basis as a result of our review. Now, as noted previously, when more material deficiencies or errors are identified, we generally expect issuers to correct them by restating and refiling the related documents. So some examples of when we would require a refiling would include a situation where an issuer had restated their financial statements due to an accounting error, but did not restate its MD&A to reflect a material weakness in the design and or operating effectiveness of its internal controls over financial reporting that caused the accounting error to occur. Other examples include the refiling of an MD&A to remove uh, misleading non-GAAP financial measures and to give greater prominence to GAAP measures. It could also be when we have a refiling of a technical report where the report file was not in compliance with National Instrument 43-101. And uh, a last example that I'm going to give is the refiling of a business acquisition report that was not previously filed. Now, refilings occurred in 25% and 24% of cases in fiscal 2018 and 2017, respectively. And we note that 39% and 33% of cases in fiscal 2018 and 17, respectively, resulted in no action. Now, in these cases, the issuer could have been selected um, in order to monitor the overall quality of disclosure of a specific topic, to observe trends, and to conduct research, but no action resulted from the review. 
However, we note that no action doesn't mean no findings. There could be issues that are identified as part of our reviews, which we decide to take no action on given the significance or the materiality of the findings. Overall, you'll see that 51% and 43% of our review outcomes in 2018 and 2017 respectively required issuers to take action to improve and or amend their disclosure or resulted in the issuer being referred to enforcement, cease traded, or noted in default. In our discussion of CSA Staff Notice 51-355 and our fiscal 2018-17 continuous disclosure program results, I also want to mention that this staff notice contains an appendix which has a list of common disclosure deficiencies that we see more often in our reviews. This list gives both our observations as well as considerations for improving your disclosures. The common disclosure deficiencies included in the 51-355 appendix are listed on this slide. And some of these deficiencies will be discussed in detail later in this presentation. For example, non-GAAP financial measures, discussion of operations in the MDNA, and mineral project disclosure deficiencies. Others will be addressed when I refer to the staff notices that have resulted from the IORs conducted in 2018 and 2017. Some deficiencies that I feel are worth discussing briefly that are not covered in the rest of the presentation are the following. Under financial statement deficiencies, one of the common deficiencies we see relate to fair value measurements, especially when it comes to measurements that fall within the level three fair value hierarchy, which are fair value measurements that are based on unobservable inputs. Some issuers do not provide sufficient disclosure of the valuation techniques, processes, and policies used in the fair value measurements categorized within level three of the fair value hierarchy. In addition, some issuers do not provide disclosure of quantitative information about the significant unobservable inputs used in the fair value measurement categorized within level three and are not providing a narrative description of the sensitivity of the fair value measurement to changes in those unobservable inputs. We remind issuers that fair value disclosures help users of financial statements to assess the techniques and inputs used to develop fair value measurements. Under MDNA deficiencies, one of the common deficiencies we see relate to related party transactions. For example, issuers would either copy and paste the related party disclosure from the financial statements or cross-reference to the financial statements. However, disclosure of the identity of the related party and the business purpose of the related party transaction are not required under I4S, but is required under the MDNA form. We remind issuers that the disclosure requirements in the MDNA is different to the disclosure requirements under IFRS for related party transactions, and issuers should consider whether the financial statement disclosure is sufficient to meet the MDNA requirements. So this is an example of disclosure of a related party transaction that would not meet the MDNA form requirements. So as of December 31st, 2017, the company was owed $10,000 from a related party and the comparative amount 2016 for 7,500. This disclosure is not specific and primarily repeats information that the reader can see in the financial statements. It states that the company was owed $10,000 from a related party, but doesn't state who the related party is or why the related party owes the company money. The disclosure also doesn't provide useful information to enable the reader to understand the transaction's business purpose and economic substance. Now, this is an example of improved disclosure for the same company. So as of December 31st, 2017, the company was owed $9,742 from John Smith, the CEO of the company. An amount of $12,000 was loaned to the CEO at the end of 2016 as a personal loan for a home. The company offers personal loans for a home to all employees that have worked at the company for five years or more up to an amount of $15,000. The loan to the CEO carries interest at 3% and is payable monthly installments over a term of five years. The loan is carried at amortized costs. You'll note that this improved disclosure provides a lot more detail beyond what the reader can find in the financial statements, including the identity of the related party, the business purpose of the transaction, and the measurement basis of the transaction. The key takeaway from this example is that the disclosure requirements for related party transaction is different between the IFRS and the MDNA form. We also want to note that there are some disclosure examples and discussion in the appendix to Staff Notice 51355 on the topics listed on this slide, which you may find helpful. I'm going to elaborate now on some key findings from some of the fiscal 17 and 18 issue-oriented reviews I just mentioned. The staff notices that were published in 2017 and 2018, which I'll talk about now, are all CSA staff notices, meaning that all or multiple jurisdictions participated in the review. Some jurisdictions could perform their own issue-oriented reviews, which could result in one or more staff notices specific to that jurisdiction. 
For many of the issue-oriented reviews we perform, we will go on to publish a staff notice outlining our findings. Now, this slide covers the staff notices that were issued in fiscal 2017. You can refer to those notices for additional detail. But in brief, we had issued staff notice 51347, which outlines the findings on our IORs of compliance with risk disclosure requirements relating to cybersecurity risks that are material. Staff Notice 51348 outlines findings on our issue-oriented review of social media disclosures and how they comply with 51102 to prevent unbalanced, misleading, or selective disclosures. Staff Notice 51349 outlines findings on our issue-oriented review of investment entities and the required disclosures under IFRS 10 to provide fulsome and entity-specific information to investors. And finally, Staff Notice 58308 outlines findings on our issue-oriented reviews of compliance with 58101 in disclosing policies regarding the representation of women on boards and in executive officer positions or explain reasons for not having such policies in place. This slide covers the staff notices that were issued in fiscal 2018. Again, you can refer to those staff notices for additional detail, but in brief, Staff Notice 52329 outlines findings on our IORs of distribution disclosures and non gap financial measures in the real estate industry. We found that real estate issuers need to be more transparent about the various adjustments made in arriving at non gap financial measures, particularly maintenance capital expenditures and working capital. Real estate issuers should also provide appropriate disclosures when they're distributing more cash than they are generating from their operations. Next, we have Staff Notice 58309, which outlines our findings on our IORs of compliance with 58101 and disclosing policies regarding the representation of women on boards and executive officer positions, or explain uh, reasons for not having such policies in place. Now, this is the third consecutive annual review of this nature. Finally, we have Staff Notice 51354, which outlines the findings of our project to review the disclosure by reporting issuers of risks and financial impacts associated with climate change. Marie France will now present highlights from the OSC Corporate Finance Branch Annual Reports. Thank you, Mandy. The Corporate Finance Branch Annual Report provides an overview of the branch operational and policy work during our most recently completed fiscal year and in March 31, 2018. It discusses future policy initiatives and sets out how we interpret and apply our rules in certain areas. The report gives guidance on certain topics and is intended for individuals and entities we regulate, their advisors, as well as certain investors. As you can see on this slide, the report aims to encourage compliance with regulatory obligations, improve disclosure and regulatory filings, provide insights on trends and guidance on novel issues, and inform on key policy initiatives. Areas that are covered in the report include uh, continuous disclosure reviews of reporting issuers, reviews of public distribution of securities, so prospectuses, a review of exempt market activities and related policy development, insider reporting, as well as review and consideration of application for relief from regulatory requirements and designated rating operations. You may ask yourself, how, how do we think about preparing this report? Which topics do we include? Well, when putting the report together and thinking about the topics we want to cover, we think about the areas that we repeatedly issue comments on, whether in CD reviews or prospectus filings, for example, MD&E or non-GAAP financial measures, areas that would benefit from pre-filing or early discussion with staff, novel issues. We also talk about recent and ongoing policy initiatives. And finally, we provide you with some practice tips. We encourage issuers and their advisors to use this report as a guide to help improve the disclosure. As you know, we review the continuous disclosure for reporting issuers where the OIC is the principal regulator. Based on the full reviews, some of the trends and guidance identified in the report are listed on this slide. These trends are similar to those discussed by Mandy. Other presenters will also discuss these topics in further details today. However, there are a few points that I actually would like to highlight today. A DMDNE is one of the top two documents we most often request issuers to file or refile. Common areas of deficiencies noted are found in the discussion of liquidity and capital resources, the discussion of operations, risk and uncertainties, uh, changes in accounting policies, and summary of quarterly results. In our report, we include best practices to improve each of these areas. The second most common disclosure document that we request to refile are the mining technical reports. We continue to see non-compliant disclosure of preliminary economic assessments in technical reports. Non-GAAP financial measures. What can I say? 
The prominence of non-GAAP disclosure and the lack of transparency continues to be of concern, and we continue to be concerned about the potentially misleading use of non-GAAP financial measures. Our report reminds issuers to follow the guidance in CSA Staff Notice 52306. And looking ahead, the OSC is seeking to replace this staff notice uh, with proposed National Instrument 52112, which was open for comment until December 5th, 2018. And Alex will discuss this topic uh, in details later today. We also discuss forward-looking information and crypto asset disclosure. Forward-looking information should include valuable insights into the issuer's business and how the issuer plans to attain its objectives and targets. We have included best practices, as well as presentation tips related to forward-looking information. Finally, given the significant growth of the blockchain and crypto asset sector over the past year, our report reminds these entities that investors need to be provided with sufficient disclosure, sufficient information to understand their business, and that the disclosure must comply with National Policy 51201 disclosure standards. If you look on the next slide, we also talk about and address public offerings. Another key component of our compliance work stream is the review of offering documents. As can be seen on this slide, in fiscal 2018, the number of prospectuses we reviewed where Ontario was the principal regulator was higher than the prior year. While the resource industry, so oil and gas, mining, and the financial services industry performed strongly in the Canadian capital markets, another key factor for the increase in volume in fiscal 2018 was, not surprisingly, the interest in the cannabis sector. Given the legalization of cannabis for recreational use in October 2018, we expect that the growth of the Canadian cannabis industry will continue and we'll see even more prospectuses in the next fiscal year. Disclosure outcomes where we required material disclosure changes to prospectus remain our most consistent outcome. On the next two slides, we've included some key takeaways from the branch reviews of public offering documents. So there are four deficiencies that are found most frequently in a prospectus. The first one is a description of the business and regulatory environment. The second is risk factors relating to the business or to the offering. The MD&E disclosure in a long form prospectus. And finally, the use of proceeds section. And again, our report provides some best practices to improve disclosure in these areas. The report also discusses the sufficiency of proceeds and the financial condition of issuers. It's very important that the prospectus contains clear disclosure, first on how the issuer intends to use the proceeds, and secondly, on the issuer's financial condition in order for the OSC to adequately assess whether to issue a receipt. However, you know, we also discuss in our report that disclosure on its own may not be sufficient to satisfy a receipt refusal concern in certain circumstances. As you are aware, or maybe not, the Act sets out specific circumstances under which a receipt for prospectus shall not be issued. One example is where the aggregate of the proceeds being raised under the prospectus, together with the other resources of the issuer, are insufficient to accomplish the purpose of the offering as stated in the issuer's prospectus. And the same considerations obviously apply for an non-offering prospectus. As such, is very critical, a very critical part of every prospectus review for us is considering the issuer's financial condition and intended use of proceeds or available funds in the case of a non-offering prospectus. A prospectus must contain, as I said, clear disclosure of how the issuer intends to use the proceeds raised in the offering, as well as include disclosure of the issuer's financial condition and any liquidity concerns. We may request that issuers include disclosure regarding a negative cash flow from operating activities, working capital deficiencies, net losses, and significant going concern risk. The disclosure is very important to investors because it provides an appropriate warning about significant risk that the issuer is facing or may face in the short term. And it also may help investors avoid or minimize negative consequences when making investment decisions. In some instances, an issuer's representation about its ability to continue as a going concern and the period during which it expects to be able to continue operation may be inconsistent with the issuer's historical statements of cash flows, in particular its cash flows from operating activities. In these cases, we may request that the issuer provides us a cash flow forecast or financial outlook type disclosure to support the issuer's expected period of liquidity. You know, Obviously, its ability to continue operations. 
However, again, disclosure on its own may not be sufficient to satisfy or receive refusal concerns in certain circumstances, uh, particularly where the issuer's assumption on future changes in operations are not objective and supportable. And finally, understanding that the cannabis industry varies in terms of legal and regulatory environments across jurisdictions, we have provided some guidance in the report on regulatory disclosure for issuers operating in Canada, in the U.S., or foreign jurisdictions. Our report also covers exempt market offerings, exempt relief application, insider reporting, and designated rating organizations, for which we're not going into further details today. The last section of our report covers significant policy initiatives of the branch that also involve other securities regulators in the CSA. And policy initiatives are listed on this slide. I will now turn it over to Mandy, who will discuss some of the common deficiencies identified in the MDNA during our reviews. So the first topic that I wanted to address today is the common areas of weakness that we see in the MDNA filed by small and medium enterprises. MDNAs should be meaningful to investors. As preparers and advisors, you can help add value to readers by ensuring that the MDNA complements the financial statements, provides balanced reporting, and is updated for new events. The MDNA can complement the financial statements by providing insight into the financial information rather than just repeating numbers from the financial statements. It should explain changes and, if appropriate, explain why expected changes did not happen. In addition, the MDNA should comment on the company's progress towards milestones. It should explain the reasons behind the numbers in the financial statements. The MDNA should also provide balanced reporting by addressing the bad news as well as the good. Management can earn credibility in the eyes of investors when it acknowledges things that could have gone wrong or that have went wrong and demonstrates a plan to rectify or to respond. The MDNA should also be updated for new events by clearly indicating what progress has been made in the period covered by the MDNA. If you were to take MDNA for two periods side by side, it should be clear that there are changes other than the date at the top. Overall, the MDNA should tell investors the story about what happened during the reporting period, whether that be an interim or annual period. In terms of general considerations, the MDNA should focus on material information and discuss important trends in the financial statements, explaining why balances have changed from period to period. Information may be considered material if it would influence the decision of a reasonable investor to buy, sell, or hold securities of the company. The MDNA should explain the reasons behind the numbers in the financial statements. Explaining the why will help your investors understand the reasons underlying an issuer's performance. The balances presented in the MDNA should reconcile to the financial statements, or otherwise it would be very confusing. It may not be apparent whether the difference is due to an error or an attempt to be less transparent about true performance. If you have a mineral project or oil and gas project, you should ensure that your disclosure reconciles with any technical reports that have been filed and that the technical disclosure complies with National Instrument 43101 and National Instrument 51101, whichever may apply. Finally, the MDNA should be written in plain language so that readers understand it as quickly, easily, and completely as possible. You should avoid verbose, convoluted language and technical jargon. This slide shows some common areas of deficiencies that we see in MDNAs. I will highlight some of the deficiencies we typically note around the discussion of operations, liquidity and capital resources, and forward-looking information. So the first area of the MDNA I want to talk about today is the discussion of operations. In this section, the company should provide an in-depth analysis of the company's operations for the period, including a discussion of total revenue, cost of sales, gross profit, and describe significant factors that have caused changes in these amounts. A key point to note is that simply repeating variances that can be calculated from the financial statements does not help investors understand trends. The company should explain the reasons that these changes have occurred. Over the next few slides, I'll go over some examples that may highlight ways to improve the discussion of operations. So the first topic I'd like to address under the discussion of operations is for issuers with revenue. This is one area where we sometimes see that some issuers simply repeat figures from the financial statements. In certain cases, we see issuers disclose that revenue was X dollars this year compared to Y dollars last year. In other cases, the reasons driving the growth are not thoroughly or well explained. For example, the issuer may attribute the increase in revenue solely to entering production without any further analysis. We believe that a more fulsome analysis is necessary for investors to understand how key factors impact revenue. The MTNA form requires an analysis of amounts changed by selling prices, quantities, or the introduction of new products and services. 
The discussion should also include quantification of any material variances to allow an investor to understand the key drivers of the variances. That is, if several factors are listed to explain the variance of a particular line item, your discussion should quantify how much of the variance relates to each factor. You'll see this in our next example. Now, this is an example of disclosure that we often see in the MDNA for issues with revenue. So they'll say that the company reported revenue of $7.6 million for the year ended December 31st, 2017, compared with $7 million a year earlier, an increase of 9%. The growth is mainly due to an increase in the sales of product X. Now, the disclosure is boilerplate and primarily repeats information that the reader can easily determine from the financial statements, that is, the 9% increase in sales. It states that the increase is mainly due to sales of product X, but it doesn't explain why the sales of product X increased or any changes in other product lines that may have offset the sales of product X. This disclosure doesn't provide useful information to enable the reader to understand the increase in revenues. Now, this is an example of improved entity-specific disclosure for the same company. I'll give you a moment to read the example. You'll note that this example provides a lot more detail beyond what the reader can find in the financial statements. For example, it explains that sales went up due to the introduction of product X and the depreciation of the Canadian dollar and the factors that offset this increase in sales, that is the decrease in sales price of product Y. An important item to note is that the company has quantified the impact of each of these drivers. A key takeaway from example number one for issuers with revenue is to describe any changes caused by selling prices, quantities, or the introduction of new products and services. The next topic I'd like to address under the discussion of operations is for issuers with projects not yet generating revenue. I think some issuers struggle with this section of the MDNA, and there's a misconception that the discussion of operations only applies to items with revenues or cost of sales. However, securities law prescribes disclosure of some specific items to help investors further understand a company's operations in situations when discussion of revenues are not significant, such as a company that is still in the development stage. Item 1.4D of the MDNA form prescribes disclosure for issues that have significant projects that have not yet generated revenue. The form requires a description of the project, a discussion of the company's plan for a project, and status against originally projected plans. We often find the initial discussion is not updated to show the company's progress against their initial plan. To be meaningful to investors, project updates should discuss the status of the plan, expenditures made in the current period, and the expenditures to date, and anticipated timing and cost to reach the next phase or milestone of the project. This information is helpful for investors to understand the progress that an issuer has made on a project during the current period and to understand where the company is headed. It is also useful for investors to have this information when assessing the cash needs of the issuer. This slide is an example of disclosure that we often see in the MDNA for disclosures that have significant projects that have not yet generated revenue. So in 2017, the company continued its exploration efforts on the XYZ Lake property, including additional drilling on the fire zone, which continues to intersect significant zone of mineralization. In addition, geophysical surveys identified several targets for testing, which may represent zones of mineralization similar to the fire zone. In 2018, the company expects to continue its drilling efforts to outline the fire zone mineralization and also drill test the geophysical targets. The company anticipates it will be in a position to disclose an initial mineral resource estimate on the XYZ Lake property in 2018. Now, this is an example of common disclosure by companies with projects that haven't yet generated revenue that likely fails to comply with the securities law requirement. The disclosure is vague and lacks the details and quantification that would make it meaningful. Although there is some discussion about next steps, there is no context about the project in terms of the specific progress and about the cost to take the project to the next step. Now this slide illustrates improved disclosure on how an issuer could discuss its plans and expected expenditures for its projects. I'll give you a minute to read the example.
So this example illustrates improved disclosure of how the expenditures in the current period were spent and how that relates to the timing and cost to take the project to the next stage. Now, entity-specific disclosure will vary based on the status of the project, which may include factors such as the drilling, construction and development, engagement with authorities for approvals and permits, or engagement with locals for social licenses. The important takeaway from this slide is that significant projects that have not yet generated revenue should be considered as part of your discussion of the results of operations, and the disclosure accompanying it should provide investors with the plan for the project, status of the project relative to that plan, and expenditures made, and how how these relate to anticipated timing and costs to take the project to the next stage of the project plan. In addition to the disclosure required in the discussion of operations for projects not yet generating revenues that I just discussed, there are additional disclosure requirements for venture issuers that have not had significant revenue in the last two years. While this disclosure applies specifically to venture issuers, this disclosure is also relevant and meaningful for non-revenue generating non-venture issuer. Now, this slide lists some of the specific cost items that venture issuers without significant revenue must break down. The specific list of items can be found in Section 5.3 of NI51102. A component of costs is generally considered to be a material component if it exceeds the greater of 20% of the total amount of the class and $25,000. Another takeaway from this slide is that if the venture issuer's business is primarily involved in mining, exploration, and development, this analysis must be presented on a property-by-property -property basis. As far as presentation goes, this information may be disclosed in the financial statements or in the MDNA. Now, this slide is an example of disclosure that we see for issuers that have not yet generated significant revenue from operations who have chosen to capitalize its exploration and evaluation costs. You can see here that there's no breakdown of the expenditures by material components. Although the disclosure is on a property by property basis, because there's no breakdown by material components, it's very difficult for an investor to understand where and how the money was spent on these projects. This slide illustrates improved disclosure by an issuer presenting and expenditures for its projects. This is the first of two slides. This slide shows separate disclosure of acquisition costs. This allows an investor to focus on what the issuer spent on acquiring new claims for a property and helps to distinguish these costs from the exploration of the same or other properties. This slide shows the second part of the makeup of the mineral property balance, that being exploration expenditures. You can see that there's a breakdown of the material components of the exploration expenditures, including camp costs, drilling and salaries. As noted on the previous slide, a component of cost is generally considered to be a material component if it exceeds the greater of 20% of the total amount of the class and $25,000. What is not shown on the slide is similar disclosure for the comparative period. Although not shown here in the interest of not overcrowding the slide, disclosure of comparative information is expected. In addition, while the requirements in Section 5.3 of 51102 do not specifically require a qualitative discussion of the expenditures, staff is of the view that a discussion of the issuer's e e assets or expenditures and g and expenses should be included as part of the issuer's analysis of its operations under Item 1.4 of 51102F1. This slide has some reminders for you to consider when you're preparing for your next MDNA. If you have revenue, don't forget to consider the price and volume analysis. If you have significant projects that haven't generated revenue, don't forget to describe the project and the timing and costs to take the project to the next stage. If you're a venture issuer that does not have significant revenue, don't forget to provide a breakdown of material components of your material costs. Another area where we would like to see improved disclosure is the discussion of liquidity and capital resources in the MDNA. The form requirements are set out in items 1.6 and 1.7 of the MDNA form. We often find generic discussion of current cash balances and current working capital balances. A good analysis of liquidity includes a meaningful discussion of cash from operations, investing, and financing beyond stating balances from the financial statements. The disclosure should explain why management believes it has sufficient resources. Issuers can improve their discussion of working capital requirements by better explaining and quantifying their working capital needs and how their working capital needs relate to their plan for the next fiscal year or up to the next business milestone. Merely noting working capital in excess of last year's expenditures is not typically 
likely sufficient for investors to understand why the issuer believes it has sufficient financial resources if the plan or outlook isn't also disclosed. For example, if an issuer has expenditures of $2 million in the prior year, it's not sufficient for the issuer to state that they have working capital of $3 million, which exceeds the $2 million in expenditures incurred prior year. Instead, the issuer should discuss what they plan to be spending and whether the $3 million in working capital is sufficient for those planned expenditures. In addition, rather than repeating items that are reported in the statement of cash flows, a company should concentrate on disclosing the primary drivers of cash flows and the reasons for material changes and major sub-items underlying the line items reported in the financial statements. Companies should also consider whether they need to provide enhanced disclosures about significant debt instruments, guarantees, and covenants. This disclosure is important so that investors can understand any anticipated funding shortfalls and financing resources available to meet spending commitments and continue new key projects. If there appears to be a cash flow problem, it's important to focus on realistic solutions and to provide an analysis that will let investors know how you will carry on your business. In addition, companies should disclose significant developments in liquidity or capital resources that occur after the balance sheet date. Now, the next two slides summarizes the requirements in the MDNA for liquidity and capital resources. They're included here for your reference. The main objective of the liquidity and capital resources section is for an issuer to discuss its uses of cash, its sources of cash, plans to remediate any deficiencies, and any risks associated with liquidity. We will move along to the example. This is an example of boilerplate disclosure of liquidity and capital resources. So at year end, the company had cash of 10,000, total current assets of 500,000, and total current liabilities of 700,000. This resulted in a working capital deficiency of 200,000. Nonetheless, management is confident that the company has adequate financial resources to address its requirements and can arrange alternative sources of financing if necessary. Now in this example, the company repeats the balances for cash, current assets, and current liabilities, which are already readily available from the financial statements, but doesn't provide any analysis of what these balances mean in relation to the liquidity and capital resources of the company. The company also states that it has a working capital deficiency of $200,000, but doesn't explain how it plans to address the deficiency. The next two slides describe entity-specific disclosure. I'll give you a minute to read over the slide. The disclosure on this slide provides a more thorough analysis of the company's liquidity and capital resources by discussing the amounts needed to maintain operations, to meet its debt obligations, and to fund development. Clear entity-specific disclosure is important so that investors can understand any anticipated funding shortfalls and financing resources available to meet spending requirements and to continue the key projects. It's important to focus on realistic solutions and to provide an analysis that will let investors know how the issuer will carry on its business. The entity-specific disclosure continues on the next slide. You can see here that the company also provides an analysis of the potential sources of funding for each of its major cash uses in 2017. Now, overall, this disclosure provides a more meaningful and useful analysis of the company's liquidity and capital resources. This slide has some reminders for you to consider when you're preparing for your next MDNA. Don't forget to disclose your working capital requirements as well as an analysis of expenditures required to maintain capacity to meet planned growth or to fund development. So forward-looking information. What is that exactly? It is about the disclosure about possible events, conditions, or financial performance that is based on assumptions about future economic conditions and courses of action, and it's relatively broad. As you can see on the chart, forward-looking information includes two subcategories dealing with financial information. The first is forward-looking financial information, or FOFI, and the second is financial outlook. Now, both FOFI and financial outlooks are subsets of forward-looking information. Both deal with prospective financial performance, financial position, or cash flows, which are based on assumptions about future economic conditions and courses of action. The difference between FOFI and financial outlook is the format in which the financial information is presented. In the case of FOFI, the information is presented in the format of a historical financial statement while it is not for a financial outlook. Examples of a financial outlook would include projected EBITDA, expected revenue, profit or loss, EPS, or R&D spending. 
We don't see FOFI very often, but when we do the disclosure, it's generally found in prospectuses or rights offerings. An example of forward-looking information that is not FOFI or financial outlook would be when there's an estimate of future store openings by an issuer in the retail industry. We will now review key considerations and expectations when disclosing FLI. Is FLI identified? For example, has the issuer noted that projected revenue is forward-looking information? The second piece is, is there a reasonable basis for the disclosed FLI? In determining what constitutes a reasonable basis for forward-looking information, a reporting issuer should consider the reasonableness of the assumptions underlying the forward-looking information and the process followed in preparing and reviewing the FLI, as this could be misleading if not disclosed and not very useful. Are assumptions supporting financial outlook and FOFI reasonable, entity-specific, and disclosed? So does this issuer disclose what the assumptions are that support the projected revenue figure? Is the FLI presented for a reasonable period? So has the issuer presented revenue for multiple years? Other considerations are have users been cautioned that actual results may vary from the forward-looking information? Have the risk factors that cause actual results to vary been identified? Now, this is a key point. Updating previously disclosed FLI helps investors understand how actual results would differ materially from FLI and how the reporting issuer is progressing in relation to its plan. If events or circumstances occur which make it unlikely that material FLI will be achieved in the future, then there is a responsibility to provide an update. And finally, have material differences between actual results and previously disclosed financial outlook and FOFI been disclosed? I also want to highlight some findings from our Corporate Finance Branch report, which was introduced earlier in this presentation. We have seen that many issuers disclose FLI in news releases, MDNA, prospectus filings, marketing materials, investor presentations, or on their website. Some of our recent observations include the following. Generic factors and assumptions continue to be disclosed, and FLI assumptions are not being quantified. As I've previously discussed, disclosure of specific and relevant material factors or assumptions, including material risk factors underlying the forward-looking information, is needed for investors to understand how actual results may vary from FLI. In addition, we want to highlight some findings relating to issuers that disclose FLI in their prospectus or CD documents for a period beyond the issuer's next fiscal year end, that is, multiple year targets for projected EBITDA for fiscal 2018 and beyond. We continue to observe that issuers are not providing reasonable and sufficient assumptions to support FLI beyond the fiscal year end. Part 4B of National Instrument 51102 states that an issuer must not disclose a financial outlook unless the financial outlook is based on assumptions that are reasonable in the circumstances. It further states that the financial outlook that is based on assumptions that are reasonable in the circumstances must be limited to a period for which the information in the financial outlook can be reasonably estimated. For many cases, that time period will not go beyond the end of the reporting issuer's next fiscal year. Now, as a result, in our reviews, we may raise comments in respect of the reasonableness of the time period of FLI presented. Where FLI is presented for multiple years, and is not sufficiently supported by reasonable qualitative and quantitative assumptions, we may ask issuers to limit the disclosure of FLI to a shorter period, for example, one or two years, for which reasonable support does exist. Now, for investors who assess whether the assumptions underlying the issuer's FLI are reasonable, the issuer should disclose those assumptions in the prospectus and CD documents as applicable, both quantitatively and qualitatively. For example, an issuer projecting aggressive growth targets without the benefit of historical experience should be able to show a reasonable basis for those targets, including key drivers behind the projected growth with reference to any specific plans and objectives that support the projected growth, and why management believes that each of the targets or FLI are reasonable. In these cases, due to the long-term nature of the FLI, it becomes even more important that issuers update previously disclosed FLI on a regular basis in their continuous disclosure, by including a comparison of actual results to previously disclosed FLI. We will now highlight an example that illustrates this point. So in this example, it says that ABC Company achieved sales growth of 10.5% in 2017 and maintained capital expenditures at $15 million. So you can see that this disclosure does not provide a comparison of actual results and previously disclosed FLI. Now, this is a good example of entity-specific disclosure. 
The issuer provides a table that lists its 2017 objectives, then provides a comparison to the actual results. For example, the 2017 objective is that the issuer will achieve sales growth of 3 to 4%. On the right-hand side, the issuer describes its accomplishment towards achieving this objective and states that the issuer had sales growth of 10.5% and explains that the increase in sales growth achieved during that, that fiscal 20, uh, 2017 was due to the introduction of product X in Q3, which resulted in sales growth of 6% and a 75% increase in sales volume of product R, which explains the remaining increase in sales growth. Here you can see that there is a quantitative and qualitative discussion of material differences and investors can clearly see the difference in the amount achieved and understand the why. This disclosure is informative, clear, and useful. This disclosure is important for investors in their assessment of the effectiveness of management and of current and future business performance of the company. A comparison will allow investors the opportunity to assess the reasonableness of previously disclosed FLI and adjust expectations. I will now pass it on to Alex to discuss our next topic on non-GAAP financial measures. Thank you, Mandy. My name is Alex Fisher, and I'm a member of the Office of the Chief Accountant and one of the leads on the topic of non-GAAP financial measures. Uh, a topic that always attention of stakeholders is non-GAAP, and this year this topic received extra attention as a result of our newly issued proposals, which will be the crux of my discussion. So before I present the proposals, I think it's important for us to have a clear understanding of the distinction between GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. GAAP is generally uh, a number that is recognized, measured, presented, as, and disclosed in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, such as IFRS, and those numbers are found inside the financial statements, including the notes. So we can think of, for example, net income included in the income statement. Non-GAAP are numbers that are found outside of the financial statements, such as the management discussion or analysis or press relief, for example, and adjust in some way, add to, subtract from a gap measure. So if we think of our net income example, it would be net income adjusted for, for example, restructuring expenses. Non-GAAP financial measures portray a different picture of performance, position, or cash flow, um, and often it is more favorable, and I'm going to touch upon that comment in the next few slides. To help ensure such measures do not mislead investors, Staff Notice 52306 includes disclosure expectations, which staff at the OSC have reviewed and updated several times over the past 15 years. So what's been happening over this time frame? Well, Non-GAAP financial measures have grown in popularity, now with over 80% of TSX60 reporting issuers reporting some form of non-GAAP financial measure. So this spans across all industries, all sizes of companies. And in general, it's found that non-GAAP financial measures are upwardly focused. They portray a more positive view of performance, lack comparability, so there's varying labels, calculations, disclosures. And at times, the disclosures have been inconsistent with our expectations as outlined in Staff Notice 52306. So these external findings are not surprising to us. Um, very consistent are our own internal findings. We can look back across the year, starting maybe even um, several years ago. In 2013, we did a review of 50 reporting issuers found concerned in 86% of entities. Fast forward a few years to 2016, OSC had a number of prominent reporting issues restate documents because of non-GAAP financial measures. And over the years, we've also found that other financial measures that do not meet the definition or the precise definition of a non-GAAP financial measure as outlined in 52306 can be equally problematic if not accompanied by appropriate disclosure. Such measures include those disclosed inside the notes to the financial statements but lack context when taken outside the financial statements. These external and internal findings were concerning and a greater desire grew for regulatory action. As a result, CSA staff organized a cross-functional working group uh, from representatives from Alberta, British Columbia, Quebec, and of course Ontario, who carefully considered how to best improve disclosures for investors, formalize their disclosure expectation in order to reduce uncertainty for issuers, facilitate enforcement for us, the CSA, and also be conscious of regulatory burden. So after careful analysis, there was a proposal for a best way forward, and that was to develop a rule that was substantially based on our staff guidance in 52306 that it would be also accompanied by a companion policy. So we issued our proposals in September, and they're available for download on the OSC website. And 
I want to spend the rest of the time just touching upon our proposals. So our proposals can be broken down into two parts, fundamentally, a national instrument that sets out the requirements and a companion policy that sets out supporting staff guidance and examples. So we focus on the national instrument. I think the best way to understand it is to think of it in three parts. One, application, who does it apply to? Two, definitions, what does it apply to? And three, disclosures, when the rule apply, what disclosures are required? So I'm gonna to touch upon each of these pillars. So the first one is application. So the proposals apply to all issuers, including investment funds, with the exception of SEC foreign issuers. The rule applies to all documents and written disclosures, including websites and social media. And it applies to each standalone document. I think it's important to emphasize a few things. The proposals only apply to financial measures as defined in the instrument. The proposals only apply if and only if an issuer chooses to disclose such financial measures. And it does not limit an issuer's ability to disclose non-GAAP or other financial measures, subject to, of course, those measures not being misleading and complying with our disclosure requirements. So what does the rule pertain to? Well, it pertains to the disclosure of financial measures that fit into one of these categories as portrayed on the slide. And I think when I think of it, um, I, I think of it as in two buckets. The first bucket is non-GAAP financial measures. And, and many of us have been familiar with this category uh, because it's, it's ones that we've regulated over the years. The second bucket is other financial measures. And if this is a new bucket that we're introducing in response to investor concerns regarding the quality of disclosure of these particular financial measures. And these measures include segment measures, capital management measure, and supplementary financial measures. And for preparers out there, they will be familiar with these terms and concepts because they're fundamentally based on concepts in IFRS and US GAAP. And the terms are also defined in the instrument themselves. So what happens if you're an issuer um, that is in scope of this as a rule that is disclosing one of these measures, as I previously discussed? Well, you have to provide some disclosure, some context for this measure. And many of these disclosures will not be new. They're, they're going to be quite familiar to people that are familiar with 52306. The requirements for non-GAAP, non-GAAP financial measures, are substantially the same as in 52306, but of course expanded for clarity and precision. And our disclosure requirements for other financial measures are similar to the ones in non-GAAP, but have been scaled accordingly to reduce, to address, I would say, the risk and concerns. So they've been really scaled down to address those specific concerns that we're worried about. And disclosures include such things as a reconciliation back to the numbers in the financial statements, ensuring the measure is not presented with more prominence than the GAAP measure, usefulness, explaining the usefulness of the measure to investors, um, just to name a few. So I'm going to leave this slide for your reference. So I'm not going to go over this specific slide in detail, but I did want to point out that our proposals contain a decision tree, which aims to illustrate the general thought process of how to navigate through the rule. Uh, and I'm going to leave this with you for your reference. So next steps. So our proposals were published in September. Um, the common period ended in December 2018. And we received over 40 comment letters and over 250 pages of comments. So uh, a very good response to, to our proposals. Um, we're considering the, the comments, going through them, analyzing them, and considering next steps forward. So I would say at this point, stay tuned uh, for more messaging on non-GAAP to come. So at this point, I want to pass it on to Craig, who will be discussing mining disclosure for issuers. Thank you. My name's Craig Waldy. I'm a senior geologist at the Ontario Securities Commission. And the goal of my portion of the presentation on mining disclosure issues is to cover uh, the main issues that you should be aware of in order to reduce the possibility of receiving a comment letter from us requesting that your company either revise, clarify, or retract their technical disclosure. The issues that I will discuss relate to National Instrument 43101 Standards of Disclosure for Mineral Projects. And this national instrument governs how mining issuers publicly disclose scientific and technical information about their mineral properties. But first, I'd like to cover at a high level some of the core principles or pillars of National Instrument 43101. 
The first pillar is the qualified person, otherwise known as the QP. This is the individual that is really the foundation or the gatekeeper of National Instrument 43101. All public disclosure of technical information must be prepared or approved by a qualified person. This individual needs to satisfy the definition of a QP in National Instrument 43101, and we refer to this as the three E's. There's the education requirement, meaning a university degree in geoscience or engineering related to mining, ethics, being a member of a professional association referred to in National Instrument 43101, and experience, or more specifically, relevant experience in the task that they're responsible for, such as mineral resource estimation. The second pillar relates to standards and best practices developed by the industry. And in mining, that's the, for Canada, that's the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy, and Petroleum. There's the CIM standards, which set definitions for terms, such as mineral resources or mineral reserves, and the CIM best practices. And this governs or provides guidance related to professional practice that the QP should follow. And the third pillar is the technical report. This is the publicly filed report prepared in accordance with a prescribed form and signed off by the qualified person, which may in some instances need to be independent of the issuer. So the overall objective of 43101 is to ensure that technical disclosure is based on reliable information reflecting professional opinions based on industry best practices and reported using standardized terms. In other words, disclosure with professional accountability. After doing technical disclosure reviews for about a dozen years, sometimes the problems or the deficiencies are easy to spot as represented by this image. There's really only one correct way and uh, we often see lots of, of uncorrect or problem disclosure. So over the next four slides, I will quickly, quickly cover about 15 common technical disclosure red flags. And one thing to remember is that your website is part of your disclosure record. Often we see disclosure issues in corporate presentations. And this is actually one of the first things we'll look at when we're reviewing a, a mining company is to go to their website corporate presentation. Okay, here's the first slide related to common red flags. First one is no qualified person named. Remember that all written disclosure of technical information must name the qualified person responsible for the disclosure. Overly promotional language. Be careful about providing terms such as world class, spectacular, or bonanza, as these can be misleading terms. The next three points relate to drilling information. Missing the location, azimuth, or dip of drill holes. The spatial information of drill holes needs to be provided in the disclosure so the reader can understand the context of the drilling information. The lack of information about true widths of mineralization. Reporting of assays needs the results to include the true widths or state that the true width is unknown. And reporting wide mineralized zones without providing the higher grade intervals. If you report, for example, 100 meters of one gram per ton gold, you must also report any higher grade zones that are included in this interval. The next four uh, points relate to mineral estimates. Using non-compliant mineral resource or mineral reserve modifiers. Only use the proper CIM terms such as inferred mineral resources, indicated mineral resources, or measured mineral resources, and not things such as mineable resources or geological resources. Never add inferred resources. Always report them separately to the indicated or measured resources. Reporting mineral estimates as contained metal only. If, for example, you report you have one million ounces of gold, also include both the tons and grade that make up this contained metal value. And lack of reporting or providing of the key assumptions, parameters, and methods. This information provides readers with important information to help understand how the mineral estimate was determined. For example, the metal price, the mining method, or the assumed processing method. The first point in this slide relates to cautionary language which needs to be provided when reporting exploration targets, inferred resources that are used in an economic analysis, 
and historical estimates. The next two points again relate to mineral estimates, such as reporting of estimates as contained grades only. You need to report both the grade for each element that makes up the combined grade. Again, it's disclosure based. Reporting metal equivalent grades without the underlying assumptions. You need to provide information about the equivalent grade and how that grade was calculated. And lastly, these three points relate to economic projections. Reporting of gross metal values or in situ metal values. Don't report these values publicly. They're very misleading and they ignore costs related to development, mining, and processing. Use of the term ore. The term ore implies mineral reserves, so don't use the term unless you actually have mineral reserves. Disclosing economic projections without a supporting technical report. If you report economic outcomes such as capital costs, mine life, net present value, these may trigger a technical report to support this information. Finally, here's a partial list of several staff notices that my initiators should be aware of. A couple of the notices to take note of include the August 12th staff notice on preliminary economic assessments, the June 2013 staff notice on technical reports, and the April 2015 staff notice on website presentations. Thank you. My name is Katrina Janke. I'm Senior Legal Counsel in the Corporate Finance Branch. Today, we will be discussing a recent review that we completed of disclosures for companies in the cannabis sector. Before I get to that, I wanted to provide you with a brief overview of this industry in general. We have seen the political, legal, and social climates changing in favor of liberalization measures around cannabis use. Canadian medical cannabis regulations became effective in 2014, creating a new corporate industry segment. The Canadian federal government introduced the Cannabis Act in April 2017, which legalized the recreational use of cannabis in October 2018. Canada is now the first G7 country to legalize cannabis for recreational purposes. Other countries in Latin America and Europe have legalized cannabis for medicinal purposes, and over half of the U.S. states have legalized cannabis for medical or adult use, or both, despite the fact that it remains a Schedule I controlled substance under U.S. federal law. In corporate finance, we started monitoring this industry after medical cannabis was legalized, when companies in our markets could apply for licenses to grow and sell medical cannabis on a commercial basis. Our first public regulatory reaction in this sector was in 2015, when we, along with our CSA colleagues, published CSA Staff Notice 51342, which was a staff review that focused on issuers entering into medical cannabis business opportunities. This was at a time when the industry was less developed and so that review mainly focused on concerns regarding misleading disclosure. Since 2015, several different types of reporting issuers have emerged. We have Canadian medical cannabis issuers. These are licensed producers under Health Canada. We have issuers operating in U.S. states that have legalized medical or recreational cannabis. We have issuers operating cannabis businesses outside of North America. We have issuers who are indirectly involved or involved on an ancillary basis in the cannabis industry. And more recently, we have Canadian licensed producers that have entered into supply agreements with various Canadian provinces and territories to supply cannabis for the recreational market. Since 2015, the industry has also grown in a number of different ways. Capital raising both in the prospectus and exempt markets has grown substantially. The market capitalization of many public companies has doubled or tripled. M&A activity has increased, and international and U.S. companies have begun to access our markets. On the U.S. side, the situation is a bit more complex because cannabis remains listed as a Schedule I controlled substance, which means it's deemed illegal for any purpose, notwithstanding the fact that over half of the U.S. states have legalized cannabis for medical or recreational use. 
Given market and investor demand in this space, and the fact that our rules are not industry specific, our focus on the U.S. front is really to ensure that all of the participants in this sector are fully aware of the unique risks surrounding this industry. We especially wanted the investors that chose to invest in this space to do so with full knowledge about the type of significant regulatory, legal, business, and operational risks that these companies may face. For example, the regulatory circumstances surrounding the treatment of U.S. cannabis-related activities are uncertain. U.S. federal law relating to cannabis could be enforced at any time, putting issuers with U.S. cannabis-related activities at risk of being prosecuted and having their assets seized. These entities have limited access to capital. Certain Canadian and U.S. exchanges won't list them. Certain third-party suppliers may elect to decline or withdraw services to them that are necessary to a U.S. cannabis issuer's operations. Despite these risks, we continue to see issuers access business opportunities in the U.S. cannabis industry. As a result, in February 2018, we, along with our CSA colleagues, published a revised notice on our specific disclosure expectations for issuers engaged in U.S. cannabis-related activities. Under the disclosure framework that we have articulated in CSA Notice 51352, we have outlined in a chart format specific disclosure expectations for issuers engaged in the U.S. cannabis space. The type of disclosure is essentially determined by the level and extent of the issuer's involvement in the U.S. cannabis industry. Essentially, our disclosure expectations are more onerous for issuers in the cannabis ecosystem that touch the plant versus those that simply provide inputs to the industry in general. The notice also indicates that information should be clearly and prominently disclosed in prospectus filings and CD filings such as an AIF and MDNA. Issuers who enter our capital markets through an RTO or spin-off transaction should also include these disclosures in their listing statement. We have also advised issuers that we will continue to monitor developments in this sector. The CSA met last year to form a working group to review the disclosure of issuers in the cannabis industry. Comment letters have been sent to a variety of cannabis industry issuers over the course of last year. In terms of the scope of our reviews, multiple CSA jurisdictions were involved. Our review included reporting issuers with varying levels of involvement in the industry. Our review included reporting issuers operating in a variety of different countries and under a variety of different regulatory frameworks. In terms of the areas of interest we looked at, we looked at fair value accounting and related disclosure implications, compliance with our U.S. Disclosure Expectations Notice, and other items such as promotional and unbalanced disclosure. In terms of our findings, our main areas of concern are the accounting and disclosure practices of licensed cannabis producers. These concerns arise because cannabis growers are the primary group of reporting issuers in Canada that fall within the scope of an IFRS standard that requires them to adopt certain accounting policies and that gives these issuers unique accounting policy choices in other areas. In general, we think that investors want to know how much it costs a company to make its product. In any non-cannabis manufacturing business, that information would be clear. However, in the cannabis industry, we have found that there are many cannabis industry specific issues which make it harder for investors to understand how much it costs a licensed producer to produce its product. It is for this reason that we have asked for additional disclosure by cannabis issuers to make sure that information about the costs of production is clearly and transparently available for investors. Our findings also revealed that most issuers were not fully complying with our CSA notice on U.S. disclosure expectations and some were sufficiently non-compliant that we asked for MDNA refilings during the course of our review. 
These results were disappointing because our disclosure expectations in this area are important in ensuring that investors are fully aware of material risks related to the complex legal environment within which U.S. marijuana issuers operate. Other areas of our review focus on unbalanced disclosure and specific disclosure about foreign regulatory frameworks, among other matters. We expect that this review, as emphasized by the findings, will help to ensure that marijuana issuers continue to improve their disclosure. Our review findings were published on October 10th, as summarized in CSA Staff Notice 51357, Staff Review of Reporting Issuers in the Cannabis Industry. We will continue to monitor this space closely, including how issuers respond to the findings in our notice through their continuous disclosure. We do expect that this notice will result in better disclosure practices. I'm Jason Koskala, manager in the Office of Mergers and Acquisitions, and I'd like to give you a brief overview of the special requirements under securities laws for transactions involving related parties of a company. The goal of this discussion here is to give you a high-level understanding of the framework for disclosure, minority shareholder approval, valuation requirements, and special committee reviews of transactions that have material conflict of interest because of the involvement of related parties on both sides of the transaction. Multilateral Instrument 61101, Protection of Security Holders in Special Situations, is the rule that regulates transactions that may raise conflict of interest concerns because they occur between the company and its related parties. This rule is intended to level the playing field for minority shareholders since insiders may have information that puts them in an advantageous position relative to minority or non-conflicted shareholders. Multilateral Instrument 61101 applies to four types of transactions. Firstly, related party transactions, which are specified types of transactions between a company and a significant shareholder or other related party of the company, and would include, for example, asset sale transactions, loans, or subscriptions for shares. The rule also applies to insider bids, which are a type of takeover bid in that they are being conducted by an insider of the company and not an arm's length party. Thirdly, 61101 applies to issuer bids, which are acquisitions by an issuer of its own securities. And lastly, the rule also applies to business combinations, also known as going private transactions, which are transactions whereby an equity holder is required to sell or exchange its securities without its consent, and a related party of the issuer is either the acquirer or is receiving preferential treatment under the terms of the transaction. So, what are the requirements for conflict of interest transactions? 61101 is a catch and release rule in the sense that it has a broad scope but then provides for exemptions. 61101 has three main requirements for conflict of interest transactions. Firstly, enhanced disclosure. The rule contains deta detailed disclosure rules to reduce the information asymmetry between insiders and minority shareholders. In particular, the disclosure document for a conflict of interest transaction would typically have to include a description of the background of the transaction or the material terms of the transaction, a discussion of the review and approval process adopted by the board of directors or the special committee, disclosure of any prior bona fide offers received by the issuer or prior valuations made within the last 24 months, as well as a number of other specific disclosure items. Second, 61101 will require that an independent valuation of the consideration for the related party transaction be obtained. This would be a valuation prepared by a recognized valuator and then provided to shareholders. Lastly, 61101 will require minority shareholder approval for a related party transaction or business combination. The minority class would be determined by excluding votes attached to shares held by the issuer, any interested party of the issuer, and any related party of interested parties or their joint actors. Generally, a party would not be an interested party if it is being treated identically to other shareholders and is not entitled to receive a collateral benefit, or in other words, a side deal. In addition to 61101's strict requirements, there is companion policy guidance as well 
which comments more so on the role of directors and the independent committee when reviewing conflict of interest transactions. You'll recall that I mentioned that 61101 is a catch and release rule, so it's important to understand the exemptions that are available from the formal requirements of the rule. Conflict of interest transactions may be exempt from form evaluation and minority approval requirements, for example, where the fair market value of the subject matter of the transaction is not more than 25% of the issuer's market capitalization. This clearly is a very significant exception in that a great majority of related party transactions would be below that value. As well, issuers that are not listed on a senior exchange, such as the TSX, would not be required to obtain a valuation for a related party transaction. In other words, TSXV or CSE listed issuers would be exempt from a valuation requirement regardless of the size of the transaction. Another exemption from formal valuation and minority approval requirements is where securities are distributed for cash and the value of that transaction is not more than two and a half million dollars. As well, exemptions are provided where issuers are in situations of financial hardship or facing bankruptcy or insolvency. As noted, the Commission's views on the role of directors and independent special committees in conflict of interest transactions is discussed in the companion policy to 61101. This policy recommends that there be an independent special committee for all conflict of interest transactions. And the policy talks about the expectations for disclosure of the board of director and review and approval process. In particular, that there be sufficient information to enable security holders to make an informed decision, that there be disclosure of the reasonable beliefs of the board as to the fairness of the transaction, including the material factors considered, that there be an assessment and discussion of any formal valuation or prior valuation, and that the board would make a useful recommendation to shareholders, and any non-recommendation without extensive reasons would generally be considered insufficient disclosure. In addition to the companion policy guidance 261101, I want to note that there has been a recently published staff notice concerning 61101 and appropriate disclosure. In July of 2017, the jurisdictions across Canada that have adopted a multilateral instrument 61101 published a notice which discusses staff's review and oversight of transactions subject to that rule and the experience of staff when dealing with conflict of interest transactions. The notice describes staff's views with respect to the role of boards of directors and or special committees in material conflict of interest transactions, such as the importance of the timely formation of those committees, that those committees have a robust mandate, and that the committees are actively involved in overseeing the negotiations. The notice also describes the enhanced disclosure obligations for material conflict of interest transactions and the importance of a discussion of the desirability or fairness of the transaction in the disclosure document. The staff notice overall is intended to raise the standard of disclosure and the quality of board and special committee process. The notice elaborates on the companion policy guidance and any company and council should consider the commentary along with 61101 and the companion policy whenever they are conducting a related party transaction. Lastly, I'd like to talk about the real-time review program for conflict of interest transactions. The purpose of this program, which is conducted by staff in Ontario and other jurisdictions, is to identify and resolve issues pertaining to conflict of interest transactions in real time and before the transaction is put to security holders for a vote or closed with the intention of trying to reduce the risk of harm to minority shareholders. The focus of the program is on information circulars that are filed for conflict of interest transactions, and staff will assess compliance with the requirements of 61101 and determine whether the transaction raises any potential public interest concerns. So this would include looking at compliance with the disclosure requirements, the conditions for any exemptions from the form of valuation and minority approval requirements, and the substance and disclosure of the process that was conducted by the board or special committee. Practically speaking, the way the program works is that staff will screen information circulars when they are filed and generally try to identify any potential issues within one or two days of their filing. Following that, they will reach out to the company or its counsel and ask any questions they may have. 
After the information has been gathered, staff will determine whether or not they have any particular concerns which may involve asking further questions or seeking to obtain copies of Board or Special Committee minutes or the Board mandate or other relevant materials. If staff have received satisfactory answers to their questions, then no further action is needed. However, if staff does have concerns with the disclosure that has been provided to shareholders, then they would request that the issuer provide timely corrective disclosure or supplemental disclosure for shareholders sufficiently in advance of the meeting that the shareholders can review it. In other circumstances where staff may have more serious concerns with the proposed transaction, they may seek other orders under securities legislation or consult with enforcement staff. In conclusion, I hope this has given you a useful understanding of the special requirements under securities laws for conflict of interest transactions. I would encourage issuers to consult with their counsel any time that they are considering a transaction with a related party. 61101 is a complex instrument, and by following best practice, issuers can help prevent unexpected regulatory involvement after the transaction has been commenced. So now I'd like to turn it over to Shafali, who will discuss the OSC's whistleblower program. Thanks, Jason. Hello, everyone. My name is Shafali Joshi Clark, and I'm with the Office of the Whistleblower. The next topic that we're going to talk about is the OSC's whistleblower program and its importance for Ontario's market participants. In July 2016, the OSC launched its whistleblower program, the Office of the Whistleblower was established, and the whistleblower program policy, OSC policy 15601, came into effect we joined what is a growing trend around the world, recognizing the value of whistleblowers and the importance of providing them with a way to be heard. The purpose of our whistleblower program is to encourage individuals to report information on securities misconduct in Ontario directly to the OSC's Office of the Whistleblower or to their employer's internal compliance systems. For those who report to the OSC, those whistleblowers may receive an award of up to $5 million. Under our whistleblower program, you may be a potential whistleblower, or you may hold a senior role in your organization in that you're able to help your entity in building up those compliance systems where the internal reporting of misconduct is encouraged. Since the inception of our program in July 2016, we have received over 200 whistleblower tips, of which 10% have led to an OSC enforcement investigation. We have also returned over 200 calls on the OSC's whistleblower hotline, where whistleblowers and counsel have called us with questions about the program. Overall, we are pleased with the active participation and interest shown by whistleblowers. I encourage everyone to visit our dedicated website at officeofthewhistleblower.ca, which has more information about the program. Our whistleblower program is open to all types of securities misconduct in Ontario. We are particularly interested in whistleblower tips relating to, for example, misstatements in financial statements, where, for example, revenues, income, or assets are overstated by using inappropriate accounting policies, misleading disclosure in public filings, such as MD&As, where, for example, the company has intentionally provided misleading or overly optimistic or promotional disclosure, as well as tips involving illegal insider trading, where, for example, insiders are trading the company's stock based on knowledge of material non-public information. These types of cases typically involve sophisticated players, raise complex issues, and are difficult to detect without the assistance of whistleblowers. To be eligible for an award under our program, whistleblowers must provide information that is high quality in that they must identify who is involved, so the names of any entities or individuals, what happened, and the timing of the misconduct. With the whistleblower's assistance and information, we want to jumpstart our enforcement investigation and move the needle forward so that we can conclude the investigations effectively and efficiently. In general, the more timely, specific, and credible the whistleblower's tip relating to securities misconduct in Ontario, the more likely that the tip will be opened for an enforcement investigation. On this slide, we have provided a snapshot of the overall process from the filing of a whistleblower tip to the payment of a whistleblower award. 
Whistleblowers who wish to submit information to our program must complete a designated form and submit it directly to the OSC's Office of the Whistleblower. A whistleblower can be one individual or a group of individuals acting jointly who file a submission and may include, for example, employees, managers, contractors, as well as QPs, qualified persons for mining companies. The whistleblower policy sets out specific exclusions and exceptions for certain individuals. A whistleblower may submit anonymously to our program if they are represented by a lawyer. Under our program, whistleblowers may receive an award of up to $5 million if their tip and assistance is of meaningful assistance to OSC staff in investigating the matter and that the whistleblower's tip results in an OSC administrative proceeding or settlement where $1 million or more in monetary sanctions are ordered and or voluntary payments are made. The award range is 5 to 15% of monetary sanctions and or voluntary payments, and this award percentage is based on the specific factors that are set out in the policy. So for example, things like the timeliness of the whistleblower's report, the degree of assistance provided by the whistleblower, and the whistleblower's efforts, if any, to report the misconduct internally to their entity are all factors that may affect the percentage of award. The protection of a whistleblower's identity is a key feature of our whistleblower program because it removes one of the principal impediments to a whistleblower who wishes to come forward but fears potential adverse consequences. To facilitate the reporting of misconduct and to make people comfortable in coming forward, our program provides certain protections to whistleblowers. The first is confidentiality. Staff use all reasonable efforts to protect the identity of the individual. This is not a guarantee and disclosure may be required by law in certain circumstances. With respect to employee whistleblowers, the Ontario Securities Act was amended in three important areas. The first is anti-reprisals. It is a breach of Ontario's securities laws to take a reprisal against an employee for whistleblowing or who is considering whistleblowing. Reprisals are very broadly defined since they can take many forms and include termination, demotion, and disciplinary action. So it's not just adverse consequences, but even the threat of adverse consequences may be considered a reprisal. This protection applies to those whistleblowers who report internally to their employer, as well as those who report directly to the OSC. This is an area that the OSC is closely monitoring, and we will take enforcement action against those employers who take reprisals against employee whistleblowers. Another protection to be aware of relates to the civil cause of action. Employees who face reprisal from whistleblowing can now pursue the civil cause of action against their employer in the Superior Court. The burden of proof rests on the employer to satisfy the court that the employer did not take a reprisal against an employee for whistleblowing. Possible remedies include reinstatement and twice the remuneration lost. Another protection that both entities and employees need to be aware of relates to the use of restrictive provisions in employment agreements or confidentiality agreements that have the effect of silencing or restricting an employee from whistleblowing or preventing cooperation with a regulator. Such provisions that restrict whistleblowing are void and unenforceable. For reporting issuers in Ontario's capital markets, our whistleblower program is an opportunity for your organization to review and enhance your internal compliance and reporting systems and to foster a culture where the internal reporting of misconduct is encouraged without any fear of employee reprisal. Whistleblowers are a passionate group that want to stop the misconduct as soon as possible, and research shows that whistleblowers do want to report internally. 
We know from the SEC's whistleblower program, which has been running since 2011, that 83% of employees who received awards under their program first raised their concerns internally before reporting to the SEC. We recognize that organizations' internal compliance programs play a key role in protecting the integrity of and maintaining confidence in Ontario's capital markets. The possibility of the presence of a whistleblower in an organization is also a great motivator. Capital market participants have to ensure their internal controls, policies and procedures are robust enough to prevent misconduct or at least try and detect any misconduct early. Otherwise, you risk a whistleblower going to a regulator first. Our whistleblower program encourages employee whistleblowers to report internally and includes incentives for whistleblowers to report internally, such that reporting internally or assisting in an internal investigation at the employer are factors that may increase a potential whistleblower award. Given the SEC's experience, we think that in most cases, employee whistleblowers will report internally first, and that may motivate market participants to self-report to the OSC and avail themselves to the OSC's Credit for Cooperation program, which would not be available if the misconduct is first reported to the OSC by the whistleblower. Given the high level of interest shown by whistleblowers, it is important that reporting issuers who participate in Ontario's capital markets take proactive steps to identify and effectively address any internal reports. For reporting issuers, we have identified some key issues for their consideration on this slide. For example, you may want to consider if your entity has a whistleblower policy which encourages employees to report without fear of reprisal. Consider if there is a strong tone at the top that values and supports internal whistleblowers. In terms of the board's involvement, consider a director's level of engagement and the types of questions being asked. It goes without saying that the focus should really be on investigating the misconduct that's reported by a whistleblower rather than trying to find out who blew the whistle. Consider having defined processes and protocols for handling internal reports, which may include, for example, procedures for receiving tips, the independence of individuals responsible for their review, and the methodology for the prompt and confidential investigation of the allegations. You may also want to consider raising awareness so that employees understand these internal systems are available. You also want to consider reviewing internal policies and any existing contracts and agreements so that they are clear that employees will not face reprisals for blowing the whistle. Overall, although employees are permitted to report the securities misconduct to the OSC, it is generally preferable from the organization's perspective that misconduct is reported internally first to the entity. On this resources slide, we have identified some key resources that may be of interest to potential whistleblowers and market participants. In conclusion, whistleblower programs are a growing reality for capital market participants. Potential whistleblowers should know that various avenues exist where they can report securities misconduct. We encourage all reporting issuers in Ontario's capital markets to take proactive measures and deal with internal tips in a meaningful way, thereby reducing risk and building a stronger organization. Now I will turn it back to Jeff. Thanks, Shafali. So why is the OSE focusing on reducing regulatory burden in the public market? Changes brought on by shifts in market conditions, investor demographics, technological innovation, and globalization all have changed our market and had a real impact on public companies, including the pace of business is more rapid today. We've seen one of the largest financial crises ever with one of the slowest recoveries. There have been shifts in demographics with the boomers aging and their investment needs changing, and millennials choosing their own path as both investors and entrepreneurs. There is greater global connectivity, and we still have our own local market. And there are more choices today, more information available, and more innovation leading to both opportunities and risks. As capital markets evolve, our approach to regulation needs to reflect the realities of business for Canadian public companies to remain competitive. 
The world we're living in is different from the one that existed 20 or even 10 years ago. It can't be business as usual. Both over-regulation and under-regulation can dampen innovation and undermine the competitiveness of our capital markets. Our rules should not add unnecessary costs. Rather, they need to be appropriate and balanced against the regulatory objectives sought. In April of last year, the CSA consulted on options for reducing regulatory burden for public companies. We published CSA Consultation Paper 51104, Considerations for Reducing Regulatory Burden for Non-Investment Fund Reporting Issuers. We wanted to re-examine our rules through the lens of reducing regulatory burden to ensure they are still appropriate, necessary, and relevant. The consultation paper identified a number of options to reduce the regulatory burden associated with both capital raising in the public markets, for example, prospectus-related requirements, and the ongoing costs of remaining reporting issuer, for example, continuous disclosure requirements. The options identified in the consultation paper were grouped into five categories extending the application of streamlined rules to smaller public companies, reducing the regulatory burdens associated with the prospectus rules and offering process, which included reducing the audited financial statement requirements in an IPO, reducing ongoing disclosure requirements, including removing or modifying the criteria to file a business acquisition report, known as a BAR, reducing disclosure requirements in annual and interim filings, or permitting semi-annual reporting. The final two categories were eliminating overlap in regulatory requirements and finally enhancing electronic delivery of documents. In response to the consultation paper, we received 57 comment letters from stakeholders representing a diverse range of commenters, including public companies, investors and investor advocacy groups, law firms, accounting firms and accounting regulatory bodies, stock exchanges and industry associations. In addition, CSA staff also met with various stakeholders. In assessing the options, we took into account the need to prioritize options and focus CSA regulatory resources on projects that will provide the most impact in terms of reducing potential burden on public companies, are generally supported by stakeholders, and finally, are most achievable and within the scope of securities regulation. There were a number of options identified that we decided not to pursue at this time because they received little or no support from stakeholders or suggested significant disagreement among stakeholders as to the merits of the proposal. They appear to offer less potential for meaningful reduction of regulatory burden on public companies. They were recently considered or are being considered in the context of another CSA policy initiative or we identified substantive policy concerns or concluded that certain options fell outside the scope of our securities regulatory mandate. In March of 2018, we announced the outcome of our review in CSA Staff Notice 51353. In the notice, the CSA publicly committed to initiating in the near term the following six new policy projects. Number one, revisiting certain continuous disclosure requirements. Number two, removing or modifying the criteria to file a business acquisition report. Number three, revisiting the primary business requirements. Number four, consideration of a potential alternative prospectus model. Number five, facilitating at the market offerings. And finally, number six, enhancing the electronic delivery of documents. Two of these projects relate specifically to continuous disclosure requirements as indicated on the slide. Number one, revisiting certain continuous disclosure requirements to eliminate overlap in our forms and IFRS financial statements, consolidate two or more of the financial statements, MDNA, and annual information form into one reporting document, similar to the SEC's Form 10-K, and examine whether the volume of information in annual and interim filings can be reduced. The second CD-focused uh, project is number two, removing or modifying the criteria to file a business acquisition report. The key objective of the project is to review the current framework under securities laws for business acquisition reports with a view to reducing regulatory burden and, if appropriate, making amendments to National Instrument 51102 continuous disclosure obligations. Stakeholders have communicated that the bar requirements are burdensome because of the extra time and cost of preparing and auditing historical financial statements of the acquired company, which can impact market windows and deal timing, or that the tests, in their current form, yield anomalous results. In considering the potential changes to the bar regime, we are trying to strike the appropriate balance between investor protection and reducing regulatory burden. We expect to publish amendments for comment in 2019. As a cautionary note, please keep in mind that there are a number of steps that must occur in connection with any changes to our regulatory regime. 
including publishing changes to our rules for public comment, and as a result, there is no assurance that any changes to our regulatory regime will ultimately be adopted. Further, any rule changes we propose are ultimately subject to Ministry of Finance in Ontario approval. That being said, while it's still early days, we believe that we can find significant ways to alleviate burden in our public market. It's important for us to have a vibrant public market, and now is the right time to look at our regulations with this lens. We've reached the end of the formal portion of our presentation. I'd like to thank Mandy, Alex, Craig, Katrina, Jason, Marie-France, and Shafali for sharing their expertise with us today. Before we proceed to the q and I'd like to draw your attention to the appendix in our slide deck, which contains contact information for today's presenters. Please note that while staff are happy to answer questions, this does not replace the advice of independent third-party advisors, as we are, of course, not the attendees' advisors. Also, as I mentioned at the outset, we'll be sending evaluation forms at the end of the session. We'd appreciate your feedback, and we'll also be sending CPD certificates via email after the session. So thank you again for joining us today, and please stay online for the Q&A, which will begin shortly. Please note that there may be brief delays as we review and respond to questions on a real-time basis.